So this is the PGC webinar on using Mendelian randomization for psychiatric and behavioral traits. My name is Michel Nivar. I am in the leaky MRC IEU building where someone invented MR or maybe actually not really, but they did a lot of development of MR. And we have uh, four speakers today that will speak on uh, Mendelian randomization in, in its application in behavioral sciences and psychiatric sciences. And uh, we'll do questions in the Q&A. If it's a quick technical question, like how did you get those standard errors, then the speaker will try to answer your question uh, while typing. And the more discussion-oriented questions we'll do at the end. And we'll invite everyone to, of the speakers to uh, answer those questions. First up is Robin Wooten, who is a lecturer in psychological science at the University of Bristol and a researcher for Lovis Bergen Hospital in Oslo. And she'll speak on using Mendelian randomization for psychiatric and behavioral traits. Thanks, Michelle. Can you see my slides all right? Everything look okay? Perfect. Okay, so I'm going to start off the webinar by introducing some basic concepts of Mendelian randomization and also a few specific considerations that we think are particularly important when it comes to applying Mendelian randomization to mental health traits. So the types of questions that Mendelian randomization lends itself to is when we're trying to identify a potential causal risk factor for a mental health condition, or looking at how different mental health conditions uh, have different causal consequences. And the uh, example that I'm gonna give for today's uh, uh, presentation is the example of alcohol consumption. So how does uh, alcohol consumption influence our risk of particular mental illnesses? And how does having particular mental illnesses increase our alcohol consumption? So when we want to investigate questions of causality, the gold standard method with which to do that would be conduct a randomized control trial. So if we were to do it for this kind of question, randomize people to drink lots of alcohol over a long period of time or to never drink any alcohol at all and follow up and look at the rates of mental illnesses across these two groups. And of course, goes without saying, this would be unethical, very expensive, very time consuming. Um, and we already have lots of observational data that looks at these questions. So that's where Mendelian randomization can come in as somewhat analogous to a randomized control trial. But instead of actually randomizing individuals to drink alcohol or not, instead we make use of uh, naturally occurring random variation in the form of genetic variants, which predispose some individuals to drink more alcohol than others on average. And across these genetic groups, we can look at the prevalence of different mental illness outcomes. So we can also think about Mendelian randomization as an instrumental variable analysis. So we're trying to understand, is there a causal effect of the exposure on the outcome? And we use the genetic variance as an instrument to proxy for levels of that exposure. And the idea is that these genetic variants are independent of confounding confounders of that exposure outcome relationship. So if the assumptions are satisfied, which I'll say a bit more about in a moment, uh, then we can by the method of Mendelian randomization, reduce bias from residual confounding because these genetic variants are randomized at conception. So they're inherited independently of the confounders of the exposure outcome relationship. And we can also reduce bias from reverse causation because the genetic variants in this case for alcohol consumption are fixed through our lifetime. So the outcome in this case, the mental illness can't go back in time and change the genetic propensity that you were born with for alcohol consumption. So before I talk about assumptions, I just want to mention two different methods, methodological approaches to doing Mendelian randomization. So the first is uh, the original sort of one sample MR or individual level approach, where in one data set, you have measured genotypes, measured exposures and measured outcomes in the same individuals. So this might be possible with some more sort of common mental health conditions like depression and anxiety in large cohort studies. But when we are more interested in rarer outcomes, say, for example, schizophrenia, it's highly unlikely that we'd have large enough samples with measured genotypes, exposures and enough cases of, um, of our outcome. And so that's where the more commonly now used method of two sample Mendelian randomization or summary level Mendelian randomization comes in. So instead of actually having observed genotypes, exposures and outcomes in the same individuals, you make use of summary statistics from um, Mendele um, sorry, from GWAS studies of your exposure and a GWAS study of your outcome. 
And an important thing to mention here is that these uh, different GWASs should be coming from the same underlying population, so similar in ancestry, age, sex, etc. Okay, so moving on to the assumptions of the method, um, I'm going to talk about the three core assumptions that need to be satisfied in order for us to make causal inferences from uh, Mendelian randomization. So the first is the relevance assumption. This is that the genetic instruments must robustly be associated with the exposure. And we tend to make sure this is the case by using genome-wide significant hits from previous GWAS, ideally that have been replicated, and even better if we have known function of these particular variants. The second is the independence assumption. So there shouldn't be any confounders of the genetic instrument and the outcome. These can be, for example, population stratification, assortative mating and dynastic effects. The latter of two, which can be um, controlled for by using within family designs. And the third is the exclusion restriction assumption. So the genetic variants should only be associated with the outcome through the exposure. And the uh, biggest pitfall to this particular um, uh, assumption is pleiotropy. And I'll talk more about that in a moment. Okay, so for the rest of the talk, I wanted to focus on um, a few different considerations that I think are particularly important when applying Mendelian randomization to mental health traits. Um, they are not specific to mental health traits. I think most of these apply to complex traits generally, um, but yeah, I think they're important to consider in these types of applications. I'm just gonna pick out four to talk about in this presentation, but we did write this perspective piece for molecular psychiatry a few years back. Um, where we talked about these and many more other pitfalls of applying Mendelian randomization to psychiatry, if anybody is interested. So first of all, I think the biggest uh, thorn in the side of Mendelian randomization, pleiotropy. So I'm going to think about it in a couple of different contexts. So first of all, if we have a variant of known function, then the potential for pleiotropy is definitely reduced. So let's take, for example, if we were doing a Mendelian randomization of um, alcohol consumption, and we take this particular SNP from the ADH1B gene, which codes for the alcohol dehydrogenase 1B enzyme. And this converts ethanol to acetaldehyde very quickly if you have this particular genetic variant, um, quicker than the body can break it down into acetic acid. And the accumulation of acetaldehyde is toxic to the body, so you get a flush reaction and feeling really sick. So people with this particular variant are going to drink, on average, much less alcohol than people who don't have this particular variant. So it's not to say that there's no possibility of pleiotropy, but when function is known, that's definitely reduced. If we contrast that with genetic variants for mental health conditions, then we know, of course, that these are highly polygenic. There's no single variance of large effect. Few of the variants will have known biological function and mental health is more downstream of these genetic variants. So this increases our likelihood of pleiotropy. So this might seem pro pro uh, problematic, but actually we can make use of this high polygenicity to try and uh, control for the pleiotropy in a different way. So instead, we use these many variants in different sensitivity methods for two sample Mendelian randomization that each make different assumptions about the underlying pleiotropy. And so if we can see consistent results across different methods, then that can make us uh, more confident that the results seem to be robust and not biased by pleiotropy. So there's many, many different sensitivity methods. I think I could have filled a, a whole slide of, of different ones. I just put a few there. Um, and I think it's often difficult to decide how to select which methods to use. I really like this paper by Eric Slob and Stephen Burgess, where what they do is break down all of the methods into different assumption sets. And they suggest that you conduct one of the methods from each assumption set. And again, looking for that consistency across the methods to suggest that there's not significant bias from pleiotropy. And overall, I think to sort of summarize and emphasize this point, I'd say that one of the most important things is to start with a clear causal hypothesis, as well as applying those robust sensitivity analyses and also triangulate with other study designs, which is what Yureen and Margot are gonna tell us more about in uh, the next few presentations. So I also uh, wanted to talk about the fact that I think with a lot of mental health conditions and different risk factors, there's a very high likelihood of plausible bidirectionality. So in the case of the example I've been using of alcohol consumption, it's highly likely that alcohol consumption might make us more depressed as it's a depressant drug. And then also that being depressed might make us drink more alcohol or drink alcohol in a more problematic way. 
So these sorts of vicious cycles are very plausible in um, uh, questions around mental illness. And there, if we do a bidirectional Mendelian randomization, um, it could be that there's a true underlying causal effect if we observe an effect in both directions, but there's also other things that could be going on here. Um, so I really like in this paper by Hannah Jones and colleagues where they were looking at two very genetically correlated phenotypes, anxiety and schizophrenia, and they break down in that paper different explanations for observing bidirectional effects. So we could also be looking at common risk factors, horizontal pleiotropy and confounding by linkage disequilibrium. So they talk about some different ways to explore that. Um, these types of traits are often very highly heterogeneous as well. So we could have heterogeneity in our exposures. For example, if we take the case of alcohol consumption, it could be that alcohol consumption influences our mental health through different pathways. Potentially there's a biological effect, but potentially there's also social uh, environmental effects that occur from drinking the alcohol. Um, and we can use types of clustering methods to actually separate SNPs that seem to be acting through different pathways. So here's an example by Stephen Burgess's group of contamination mixture method. So that could be something that's um, actually investigated using this method. Um, and uh, there's obviously also high heterogeneity in outcomes of mental health as well. So we have heterogeneous patient groups and it's very likely that they will need different intervention strategies. If they're all combined in the one GWAS and that could reduce the precision of our causal effects. And I think this emphasizes the need for more specific GWAS of um, different traits. So potentially looking at particular subtypes or looking at particular symptoms, which I know is something that's an effort within the PGC at the moment. And finally, I wanted to um, emphasize that it's important to remember that if we have a binary exposure, then our interpretation is to the liability of that underlying risk to that particular exposure. So if we, for example, have our exposure is schizophrenia, um, often see it interpreted as an effect of schizophrenia on our outcome. But as we know with the genetics that we're detecting, it's the underlying liability to that condition. And in the outcome GWAS, we're only going to have a population prevalence of 1% of people with schizophrenia, right? So it's all of those traits at a sub-threshold that influence our risk of schizophrenia as well as the condition itself. And so important to interpret results when you have a binary exposure with respect to the liability for that condition. Um, so final part of the talk, I just wanted to mention a few extensions of the Mendelian randomization method that I think could be nice in terms of applying to questions around mental health. So the first is a multivariable Mendelian randomization where we put in multiple different exposures. We do this um, so we're able to identify both direct and indirect effects. So this could be to explore potential mediation pathways, or if you have a particularly known pleiotropic pathway that you want to exclude, then it could also be used for that, that um, purpose as well. And in the next talk, Jazz is going to show us an example of applying this method to um, answer a specific causal question. Um, another is thinking about progression Mendelian randomization. So, so far, everything I've talked about has been with respect to risk factors for the onset of mental illness. But for a lot of questions in psychiatry, we're actually interested instead in once people have a particular condition, um, what are the predictive factors that might mean they respond better, get better quicker, have better outcomes? Um, and so things like treatment response, remission, number of episodes, the more that we have GWARs that look at these types of traits, the better we can answer these questions, which I know is another effort in the PGC. So that's fantastic. Hopefully that can be used in, in these kinds of contexts as well. Um, it does come with its own problems. So this induces collider bias when you condition on, on incidents of having a mental health condition. Um, and this paper I'd recommend by Ruth Mitchell and colleagues um, where they go through different ways to mitigate that bias. And the final one I was going to highlight is a time varying exposure MR. Um, so this is an extension of the multivariable Mendelian randomization design. Um, but instead of having two different exposures, we have the same exposure at different time points. And I think that as we get more and more GWAS of time specific um, uh, traits. For example, I know, again, the PGC have efforts at the moment to look at adolescent onset conditions versus adulthood conditions. We can use that to tease apart specific effects of different timings. Um, so hopefully that can be well applied to those uh, upcoming GWAS as well.
So that was all from me. I'm just going to end by summarize, uh, summarize by saying that Mendelian randomization is not a silver bullet. There's um, absolutely still bias. It's just different bias from what we might traditionally see in um, observational studies. Um, and of course, the biggest source of bias is pleiotropy, and that needs to be dealt with appropriately. Um, but also, we have to be always cautious for complex phenotypes because we cannot directly test with bias from pleiotropy. And so it's highly important to triangulate with other study designs that have different sources of bias. And Yurene and Margot will tell us more about that in upcoming talks. So thank you for listening. Yeah, pass back to you, Michelle. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, and then our next speaker is Jasmine Kuja, who is a senior research associate at the University of Bristol, and she specializes in psychology, but also the epidemiology of e-cigarettes and nicotine use. And she'll present a multivariable manila randomization analysis on that work. All right, there's a bit of a preview there. So, um, hi everyone. Um, yeah, so this is going to be a example of using multivariable Mendelian randomization. Uh, and this is a project where we specifically looked at trying to separate the effects of nicotine versus tobacco on depression. So that's the other constituents of tobacco other than nicotine. And this project was run by Chloe Burke, whose picture is on screen. So thank you to her. Um, so to give you a little bit of background before I get started properly, tobacco smoking has been consistently associated with depression in observational studies, but we know that those studies are at risk of bias from unmeasured confounding. And there is growing evidence that tobacco smoking causes depression, as we've seen from Robin's studies. But there's still some uncertainty around the causal mechanism by what by which that could be working. So what is it that's actually in tobacco smoke that co could cause depression? And this has been identified as a research priority fairly recently. So I'm just going to give you an example or two different examples of some hypotheses that could be um, working here. So first of all, it could be that chronic nicotine exposure leads to disruption of relevant neurotransmitter pathways, and that could lead to depression. Or alternatively, it could be the other things in tobacco smoke. So inhalation of harmful substances could lead to neuroinflammation, oxidative stress, and that could lead to depression. And we'd like to run a randomized control trial here, but we know it would be unethical and impractical because we would have to expose non-smokers unnecessarily to nicotine, knowing that it could harm them. And Mendelian randomization would be a useful tool to explore the role of nicotine, but there currently aren't any available GWAS of nicotine exposure that hasn't been conducted just among people who smoke. So it's confounded by smoking there too. And that's where multivariable MR can come in, because that can be used to tease apart the direct effects when two or more exposures are correlated, like in the case with nicotine and tobacco exposure. And I have previously done this in another published study um, where we looked at the effects of nicotine versus the other constituents of tobacco smoke on physical health outcomes. And after publishing this, one of my uh, colleagues came to me and said, well, why don't we use this model to look at a psychiatric outcome? Let's look at depression, which we have done. And we, in doing this original model, we did work out which kind of nicotine measure might be most useful here or what we could use to, to study this question. And we found that the best measure that we could use was the nicotine metabolite ratio, which is a measure of how quickly a person metabolizes nicotine and causally impacts the amount of nicotine in a person's body given a set amount of nicotine exposure. So if we imagine we have two people, a first person, person A, who has a higher nicotine metabolite ratio, they will have less circulating nicotine in their body than someone who has a lower nicotine metabolite ratio, given the same level of nicotine exposure. And that's a, an important sentence there, because person A, who has the higher nicotine metabolite ratio, as well as clearing nicotine more quickly, they'll also probably likely smoke more because they've cleared the nicotine so quickly that they're no, no longer feeling the effects of nicotine and therefore want another hit. And so when we look at just uh, your standard Mendelian randomization study, if we looked at an NMR as the exposure, we wouldn't really be sure what we were measuring here whether it's increased nicotine or decreased nicotine due to them smoking more or to them metabolizing the nicotine from their body quicker. 
So that's where the multivariable MR comes in. And here we can almost fix the amount of nicotine exposure that someone is having in our model because we include the amount of cigarettes per day they're smoking or a genetic proxy for that into the model. So we're teasing apart the nicotine element from the NMR and then also looking at the other constituents of tobacco smoke using the CPD measure. And to do this, we used summary level genome wide association data, and we restricted our analyses um, to people of European ancestry. Uh, it's for their exposures, we used cigarettes per day from the G-Scan GWAS, in which there were 55 uh, independent or conditionally independent SNPs that they found associated with cigarettes per day. And we also used uh, Buckwald's GWAS of NMR, which found seven conditionally independent SNPs. Uh, for our outcome, we used UK Biobank and looked at the major depressive disorder um, diagnosis in there. And we separated our analyses into people who have ever smoked versus never smoked. And the reason for this is that our exposure is restricted to people who have smoked. And we need to make sure that we're representing the same underlying population. And it's only relevant among people who smoke as well. But we also looked at never smokers, and the reason for that is to do some sort of negative control analysis, because we're not expecting there to be any, uh, any um, associations or any uh, causal links there. So if we do find that we see effects among never smokers, then that would indicate something's gone wrong in our, wrong in our model, potentially that there is um, some pleiotropy happening. And before I move on to interpreting, uh, for sure, showing you the results, just a quick note on how to interpret them. So as I mentioned, higher nicotine metabolite ratio does equal lower nicotine exposure, but that is only for people when we fix the um, amount of nicotine they're receiving. And so in the univariable MR, we do not really know what the effect of, of that is. But in the MVMR results, if we're thinking about nicotine exposure, we need to flip the estimate. So if they have an OR of 1.2, that would indicate a decreased risk of the outcome with increased nicotine exposure. So just keep that in mind. So to summarize the evidence that we found, we had weak evidence or quite weak evidence for an independent effect of NMR on major depressive disorder and stronger evidence for an independent effect of cigarettes per day on MDD. With pleiotropy, there was no clear evidence for an effect when we ran this among our never smokers. And our results were consistent across the different MR uh, uh, sensitivity analyses that were used, including EGA. And there was also a non-significant MR agar intercept indicating there wasn't much evidence of uh, directional pleiotropy either. For reverse causation, we explored this using Steiger filtering, and that didn't flag any variance for filtering. So we were fairly um, confident that reverse causation wasn't an issue. Uh, and as I mentioned, we had, uh, or you saw on the last slide, the conditional F statistics were all above 10, indicating our instruments were strong. So to conclude, the causal effect of smoke exposure on MDD seems largely independent of nicotine, although there is some weak evidence suggests uh, a weak effect. Um, however, we might not be seeing large effects here due to how we have proxied nicotine. Um, and that is because we're proxying for circulating nicotine. And what may be more important in this example is nicotine within the brain. And that might not be, those measures might not be aligning. Um, there are also uh, other limitations, including some of our confounders may be genetically correlated with smoking heaviness, and that could be impacting the results. We're also restricting to people of European ancestry, so they might not um, translate to other populations. However, if we are to believe the results that we've found, then I would um, suggest that they indicate that people who are using tobacco, if they switch to a non-tobacco nicotine source, they may reduce their risk of depression. So thank you very much for listening. Um, thank you specifically to Chloe for doing the work here uh, and also to the funders. And the QR code on screen at the moment is our preprint of this um, project. So please check that out. Okay. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Jasmine. Uh, I saw someone's hand flick up in the attendee, so maybe they can type their question in the chat or the Q&A so it can be answered later. Uh, and then we're going to move on to Jolien Ter, who is an assistant professor of genetic epidemiology and studies comorbidity at the Amsterdam UMC. Yes, thank you, Michel. Um, so I would like to uh, talk a bit about the current increase or explosion, you could say, of MR papers, because it's uh, increasing in popularity a lot, and also about how triangulation uh, specifically can help with that. 
So uh, as you will all know, Mandina randomization or MR, I'm just going to say is easier, has become very popular across many disciplines and definitely also in the field of psychiatry. So there's a number of reasons why this happens. First of all, uh, there's a, a, a much more uh, increasing amount of well-powered GWAS studies, and these are also often publicly available, which makes it very easy to conduct the uh, summary level type of Mendelian randomization. Uh, but also the scripts uh, have become much more automated. So there's uh, particular, particularly the uh, MR base platform where it's very nicely um, instructed how to conduct an MR study and there are packages to do so, uh, which overall has uh, made it very easy to apply. So there's many data, data sets and uh, many scripts available. So just how popular is MR? So instead of showing you this PubMed search with increasing terms of triangulation or of medieval randomization, sorry, I'm going to show you another study that we're working on, which is uh, taking this GWAS study as a starting point. So this was published in 2019, and it was the first uh, well-powered, very large GWAS of uh, tobacco and alcohol use. Um, and we were wondering how the summary statistics of this GWAS have been used so far. So if people take the summary statistics of this particular GWAS, what do they do with it? And we decided to do something we coined a GWAS impact analysis. Um, so this is work of Mo, who's a PhD student in my team. And in this figure, we can see on the upper left corner the paper itself so it's Liu et al from 2019 and then we can see all of the papers that's referenced the Liu et al GWAS paper uh, and also how those refer to one another but for this um, talk in particularly is interesting how they use the summary data and you can see in the different colors on the top right corner uh, what the methods were and you can see already that there's a lot of light blue so that's the MR analysis that have been conducted with the summary data. Um, and if we look at the numbers out of those papers, 344 that actually used the summary data of smoking specifically, 71.5% used those to do MR. So that's kind of interesting to see. Uh, but compared to the earlier days of MR, there have also been quite a few changes. So because we have a lot of these well-powered GWAS uh, data sets and samples out there, these also identify more SNPs, uh, a lot more. Uh, the MR that's being conducted is mostly summary level, so two sample data. Uh, there's, there is a larger variety of sensitivity methods, which Robin also nicely uh, showed, also from various groups around the world. Uh, and there's also more GWAS available for all sorts of complex trades. So this is in general a positive thing, right? So we have more opportunities, uh, but also this comes with risks, um, also mentioned already, but good to emphasize that there is an increased risk of pleiotropy. So we have more SNPs, but we don't know as well anymore what they do, particularly for psychiatric trades. So there's less knowledge of the biology. Um, there are a lot of individual MR studies out there, but these might be using the same or partly the same GWAS sample. So how much of those in that figure I showed that are really independent is difficult uh, to say. A lot of them are at least somewhat overlapping. Um, and related to that um, bullet point around GWAS becoming more um, popular and also having more complex traits available, it's important to talk about another assumption of MR, which is the gene environment equivalence assumption, which is nicely formulated here from a, a review of Rebecca Richmond and George. Um, and basically it means that changing uh, the phenotype through either a change in the genotype or an environmental change should have the same effect downstream on an outcome which is actually quite an important assumption um, and something that might be approximated or plausible for something like cholesterol levels or alcohol use indeed, as also mentioned, where you know a particular uh, alcohol metabolizing gene, but it might not <coughs> make as much sense for something like education or uh, years of education specifically. Um, and for depression, it might make a little bit more sense than for education, but again, maybe not as much as cholesterol. So I think this is important to take into account and something for psychiatry uh, to consider carefully when doing MR. 
And these are all points that I have not uh, thought of myself uh, only. So there are a lot of people making these uh, uh, these points and saying that we should be careful with this. I think this is quite a nice paper where uh, Stephen Burgess and others have a checklist of sort of pitfalls and things that you should consider when you're doing an MR study. Uh, so definitely also read the paper, but I also quite liked the conclusion from this paper where basically they say that performing an informative Medina randomization study requires critical thoughts and collaboration between different specialties around that topic that you're looking into as well, which I think is also something that might be missing sometimes in, uh, in MR uh, studies being conducted. And I guess when you combine this with the fact that MR is a method of causal inference and falls within the field of epidemiology, where you normally start from a causal hypothesis, and a specific question to work out. Uh, that one discussion point of mine or question would be whether it is suitable to include MR in a GWAS as a standard follow-up study, which is often done, but doesn't always give the context or, or space to really um, look at the causal question well enough. And when we talk about causality, uh, the reason that we're doing MR is because in uh, psychiatry, indeed, we cannot randomize uh, a lot of the exposures that we're interested in. So the gold standards uh, of a randomized trial is often not feasible. Um, and apart from MR, there are also other alternative methods that we could do, but these all have different kinds of crucial limitations to them. So the next topic that I would like to talk about is triangulation. And also it's here nicely formulated that no single study or methods, no matter the degree of excellence, can provide a definitive answer. So there comes triangulation, which might help. And it is this is the definition uh, posed by uh, Deborah Lawler and Kate Tilling and George Davy Smith. So basically, we want to use several approaches or viewpoints to look at the same difficult question. Uh, and have these approaches be of different uh, key sources of their bias so that we can triangulate the findings from them. And this idea is not necessarily a very new idea. So for example, it's also in the Bradford Hill criteria of causality that a finding should replicate also in different contexts. Um, and in a systematic review, for example, you might combine evidence that is replicated across samples or across studies. But what makes triangulation different uh, from that is that, first of all, it combines different types of approaches. So it's not the same as a meta-analysis as the same, uh, which includes the same uh, types of approaches. Uh, it is or should be a deliberate choice of approaches that complement one another or that somehow decrease some of the bias by choosing them together. And uh, ideally, it would be a prospective process. So it is not about post hoc combining different lines of evidence. It can also be, but in essence, it should more be a prospective process where you have your causal question and you choose your methods and then you apply them and interpret them together as well. And there are different ways that approaches uh, that are combined in triangulation studies could vary or could be different. So first of all, in the methods applied, so these are just examples that I'm not going to go into too much detail on, but just to highlight a few. So this is a nice example where they uh, wanted to know whether um, in utero exposure to antidepressant medication causes offspring ADHD. And they did a regular analysis controlling for confounders, a negative control analysis where they used the association in the uh, fathers who used antidepressant use versus the mothers. So that of course, for the fathers, there is no plausible pathway sibling control analysis to correct for familial confounding and a former user analysis <laughs> to compare mothers who previously took antidepressants but not during pregnancy to look uh, or correct for genetic confounding. So these are really different methodological ways of uh, looking at the same question. And then if a finding would be consistent across these four methods, that would be uh, a lot stronger evidence. You could look at different populations. So this is a quite well-known example where uh, the authors were interested in looking if breastfeeding affects cognitive development in offspring. And because uh, socioeconomic position is a very big confounder here, they looked in two different uh, populations. One in the UK where breastfeeding is associated with a higher socioeconomic position 
and one in Brazil where it is associated with a lower socioeconomic position. And then again, if you would find an association between breastfeeding and uh, cognition in the offspring, then it would be much stronger evidence if that association is there in both populations. And then finally, uh, people could also use the uh, measuring of the variables as a way to triangulate in different ways. But this example, I think, is quite nice where they uh, look at, uh, again, fetal, a fetal exposure uh, to alcohol in this case and ADHD risk in offspring and see whether there is a link uh, if it is measured by the mother uh, as well as by the teacher, because the measurements by the mother might also be biased and potentially genetically confounded in some way. So there are a lot of different ways that you can do it. Uh, but one important uh, commonality in all of these triangulation studies is that you start out with a certain causal question where you want to know, for example, whether alcohol exposure affects offspring. Uh, but this may translate to slightly different but related causal questions, you could call them, or causal estimates across the approaches or methods that you choose. And some of these might be part of the triangulation. So where we took the two different samples from two different countries, uh, but sometimes they're not, and you want to keep them as similar as possible. So there could be differences in the populations, uh, age, for example, ancest ancestry. The timing of onset of the proposed risk factor might differ. Uh, the duration of the proposed risk factor might differ. These are especially important to take into account. And in general, these are all things that you need to then uh, acknowledge when you compare the results of each of these methods to know what it means. Uh, and then ultimately, ultimately try to come to a best fitting explanation for that uh, particular relationship that you are testing. So many researchers apply triangulation and also triangulation is becoming much more uh, popular and uh, popping up everywhere. But how it is interpreted widely varies and what people mean with this. Uh, so we're also currently conducting a study uh, which is done by Noel, which is a systematic review of triangulation studies that look at some type of risk factor for depression. And because triangulation is not always called triangulation, we also included terms like multi-methods or mixed methods or multi-study uh, to uh, see what's out there. And out of 2,752 papers, we ended up including 89. So this is still <laughs> ongoing work, but I thought it was nice to sort of show you some of the terms that are coming up with triangulation. So all the different creative ways that people call <laughs> what they're doing and multi-methods can mean many different things we're noticing and mixed methods. So there's different ways of saying things. Sometimes people don't call it triangulation, but it is what they're doing. So we're trying to sort of arrange that uh, nicely and show how things are being done in the depression fields. There's a lot of quantitative qualitative studies, which is also a field where triangulation comes up. So uh, supplementing a quantitative analysis with a focus group, for example. Uh, and this will be still ongoing, but our next step is to see how these studies also integrate evidence because that's the most challenging thing in triangulation. In triangulation how do they actually come to one conclusion? Uh, and then I'm going to end with uh, another paper that should be coming out next week, hopefully, uh, which is a, a sort of guide that we, well, it is a guide that we uh, wrote uh, because there are so many things to consider and there wa wasn't really a practical uh, document or uh, framework to do a triangulation study. So for this, together with Eva, Hannah and Robin, we uh, wrote a review, first of all, introducing the concepts in the field of psychiatry, but also how different uh, people are using it. And it also includes a, um, a framework. I'm not going to go into all of the smaller um, details here, but just to show you the steps. So basically, we sort of want to give prompts for how you can go about this uh, with, with uh, some ideas and introducing some topics that are interesting to look at where especially it's important to start with a clear or clear enough question to draw out your uh, assumptions with DAX, identify your resources, which is also often a pragmatic um, exercise to see where you can actually get data uh, or, or include people in your team, uh, specifying your causal questions, 
for each method. And then the final two, I think, are important to um, make it explicit what the effects are of the potential biases that you are including and also what you would expect to find under uh, causality for your specific uh, study. And in the guide, we also include a worked example where we go through all of these steps for a hypothetical uh, question. So if you're interested, uh, be on the lookout or you can always ask us. And then this I thought was nice to give as an example of a pre-registration of triangulations. I think that's also very important to emphasize that when you have written out all of your assumptions, the methods, the choices that you made and your expectations for what comes out of these different methods that you should pre-register it extensively. And then you can also, it's easier to interpret it later on as well. So if you're interested, you can go to this pre-registration. And then some conclusions. So MR has become incredibly popular, uh, but it's important to uh, keep in mind that for a lot of psychiatric traits, uh, these uh, assumptions, particularly the gene environment equivalence assumption may not be plausible. Um, and then it's less causally reliable. Uh, it's important to have a clear causal hypothesis and expert knowledge. I think in general, there's a lot of uh, increase in sort of single studies doing either MR or another methods using one data set uh, in the literature. So triangulation is important to sort of try to go against that and make it more informative. And there are some questions I think that are uh, we can uh, talk about or we should ask ourselves around whether we should be doing MR for certain traits. So we, we can do MR for anything that we have a GWAS on, but should we do that? Um, especially for those where it's not plausible at all is maybe, or should we be doing it, but interpreting it differently, not as a causal interpretation as much. Uh, and what I mentioned before as MR is uh, included in a GWAS, whether or not that's a good idea or not. And that was it for me. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Jorin. Um, so we've received one question and one technical question that's already been answered. So don't be shy, type your questions in the Q&A so we can have a discussion uh, later. And then our last speaker today uh, is Margot van der Weijer, who's also an assistant professor at the Amsterdam University Medical Center of Genetic Epidemiology in Psychiatry. And she'll present an applied triangulation study. Thank you. Can you confirm that you see my slides? Yeah, great. Okay, yes, so I am Margot, I work at the Amsterdam UMC, but I'm actually presenting on a paper um, that was the last part of my PhD at the FU in Amsterdam together with this group of people, including Michel, who is sharing today. Um, and so for this project, we were interested in causal effects of education because this is just something that has been studied so much in the literature and it's been correlated to a lot of different health outcomes, including mental health outcomes, such as well-being, but also different physical health outcomes. But as you all know, once we find a correlation between education and a health outcome, we can't really be sure whether education is causally influencing these outcomes, whether these outcomes may actually be causally influencing education, or whether there's some confounders influencing the exposure outcome association in that there's actually no causal association at all. And so for this project, we were interested specifically in the causal effects of educational duration on a set of different health outcomes. Um, and so the exposure in this case is age at which people completed full-time education, so educational duration, how long people go to school. And we looked at a range of different outcomes, which were mostly mental health outcomes, well-being split in several life domains. So for instance, family uh, satisfaction or friendship satisfaction, uh, more psychiatric traits such as depression, anxiety, and bipolar disorder, but also cardiovascular problems as a physical health outcome. And then additionally, we also included some negative and positive controls because as you'll see, we'll do a triangulation study. So we do several different analyses, but then we also include these negative controls, which education shouldn't plausibly causally influence, but perhaps if there's something like uh, confounding from family SES, that it will pop up, but also positive controls like income categories, which education should causally be influencing. So I have four methods to explain you in a very short amount of time. So I'll just go through them very quickly. But as I said, the, the paper is online so you can read it or ask me questions if things are unclear. So the first one is that we looked at a raising of school living um, age reform 
in the England and Wales. So in 1972, the minimum school leaving age was increased from 15 to 16. And so people that were uh, not part of this reform, but attended school before the reform, they could leave school at age 15. And people who were at school after this reform, they could leave school uh, only from the age of 16. And so we looked at a subset of UK biobank participants that were sort of born around this window. So either they were just unaffected by the reform and could leave school at age 15, or they were just affected by the reform and they could leave school at age 16. And similar to MR, we use this a binary part of reform indicator as an instrumental variable to predict educational duration. And in this case, we predicted whether people stayed in school after the age of uh, 15 or not, or 16. Um, and then we use this as an instrumental variable, very similar to MR, but just instead of a genetic instrument, we use this reform. Then, I'm sorry for this slide, uh, but I'll walk you through it. Then we also used a sibling control design. And this is where we looked at a subset of UK biobank participants who were biological siblings, who we assume grow up in the same household. And then within each family, for each sibship, we calculate their mean uh, educational duration. And also for each sibling within that family, we calculate their deviation from the mean. And so we assume that this mean education um, is sort of confounded by sh things like shared familial environment and partly by shared genetics. And this deviation from the mean is unconfounded by shared environment. And we use both to predict these different health outcomes. Then we used a Mendelian randomization, of course, and I'm not going to explain it again because we've heard a lot about it already. But the only thing I'll say is that we use a genetic instrument based on an educational attainment. G was by Lee et al. Uh, as our instruments and that this was sufficiently powered. Oh, and I forgot to mention, but in the case of the educational reform, we also saw that there was sufficient instrument strength. And then the last analysis was a sort of special form of MR, which is within family MR, in this case, Mendelian randomization and SIP shifts, um, which functions the same as usual MR, but now as genetic instrument, we take the sibling difference on the genetic instrument, which which we predict the sibling difference in educational duration. Uh, and this is thought to have the same benefits as usual MR, but it also controls for things that are shared between siblings, such as population stratification and um, uh, assortative mating between parents. Um, so what does this look like in terms of the sample? So we use UK Biobank data, but uh, and we want the sample to be as homogenous as possible so that we don't uh, so that it can't be the case that differences in results between analyses are because of a difference in sample. But we do use subsets of the data, for instance, for sibling uh, uh, analyses, we use a subset of siblings in UK Biobank. And for the reform analyses, we use a subset that is born around this reform. Uh, a slide with a lot of information uh, might be nice to look back at later, but I think the most important point is that we use four different methods. They all have different biases, assumptions, uh, and by comparing the results across these methods, we get a better idea of potential causality. So for instance, if we find a significant result or a significant effect in the sibling control analysis, but not in MR, then perhaps this difference can be explained by the fact that the sibling analyses do not control for reverse causation, but Mendelian randomization does. Uh, and then one important thing to note is that we knew that for within family MR, we had much lower power because this is also just a much smaller sample than the, uh, the normal MR. And so we pre-registered that if this was not a significant effect, but it was the same magnitude and direction as the other analysis, then we would sort of count this as being in line with the other evidence. So let's go through the results. Um, I first have to give a brief note on the reform analysis. Here we see the effect of education, on all these different outcomes and the light green uh, ones are the estimates where we include year of birth as a covariate and the dark green ones is where we exclude year of birth as a covariate. Um, we pre-registered including year of birth. And what we found is that actually when we did this, none of the results were significant, uh, including most of the income categories, which is a bit worrisome because this is our positive control. Uh, and so when we reran using excluding year of birth as a covariate, we found results that maybe made a bit more sense. Um, but this is just a brief note in the coming slide, I'll show the pre-registered results. So including year of birth, so non-significant results, but this is something to keep in mind. <laughs> 
Um, another slide with a lot of information, but here we again see the effects of education on all these different outcomes and the different colors of the estimates reflect the different methods. Uh, and it's a bit difficult to see, so I'll just summarize. Uh, I think our, our most consistent findings are actually null findings. So things like happiness, anxiety, and bipolar disorder. In none of the analysis we did find we found evidence for a causal effect. So I think we can be pretty sure that there's no causal effect there. Um, then there were a few um, associations that were only significant in Mendelian randomization and in none of the others, which includes things like depression and cardiovascular disease. So these are, are some things I would be a bit skeptical about. Um, and then there is a few, two um, associations, those with financial satisfaction and neuroticism, where there was a significant effect in Mendelian randomization and in the sibling control analyses. And additionally, we find a similar direction of effect and magnitude of effect in the within family MR. And so it's a bit difficult to interpret because of this sort of caveat we had in the, uh, in the reform analyses. But I think these are the findings for which there's most evidence for a causal effect. So what are sort of the take home messages here? So first of all, that there's just a lack of evidence of a causal effect of educational duration on a set of outcomes, which maybe we would have expected an effect based on sort of correlational evidence. Then we do find some evidence of an effect of educational duration on neuroticism and financial satisfaction. Uh, and as you saw, there's also these few things that only popped up in MR. And I think this sort of highlights how difficult it is to interpret these results when you uh, look at the methods in isolation. And especially as Jorin already said, traits like educational attainment or duration are maybe a bit tricky for uh, Mendelian randomization because there's not really a, a clear path going from these genetic variants to the trait that we're interested in. And so I would say triangulation is always a good idea, but especially uh, if you're going to do Mendelian randomization for traits where it's just not so clear whether it's doing what it's supposed to do, then perhaps you should triangulate. So thank you for listening to all this information in a very brief time. But of course, uh, if you have questions, ask me or um, read the paper. Okay. Uh, thank you, Margot. Uh, there is one question, and it, but it's an interesting one, so I'd like to like slightly reformulate it and then just go past all of you. All of you, it's a, and some anonymous attendee says that in these days it seems MR is being applied thoughtlessly a lot uh, and without consideration for hypothesis biases, etc. And then says our cautions, your cautions, and comments are important to put out clearly for editors, reviewers, as well as readers. I'd like to slightly reformulate that, like we have to wade through a lot of. MR studies, whether we are editors or readers or, you know, interested in this specific subfield, is how do you guys go about deciding, de determining whether sort of MR study you're reading is good? So what is what are the things you, you like screen for? What are the things you, because we can't read them all, right? You have to make quick decisions sometimes. What do you guys, and we'll just go in the order of the talks, just because otherwise everyone's going to be talking to Sam. What's your sort of screening criteria when you sort of filter their literature? Yeah, I agree with you. We're receiving lots and lots of invitations to review and it can be really tricky. Um, we actually have written down some some sort of criteria that we sometimes send back to particular papers when we're saying why we don't review um, a particular paper because I was rejecting a lot of papers and feeling like actually that's probably not very helpful for editors to understand why we're saying no to things. Um, for me, it comes down to, is there a clear causal question? Does it make sense from the body of literature why you'd be exploring this? And is it instrumented well? Um, and another thing I tend to look for is, uh, I guess you'd say, like a sort of a healthy scepticism. Um, so is there a good attempt to kind of falsify what you're finding as well? One thing that we haven't touched upon too much, but Jazz mentioned was having negative controls, like where possible have people made efforts like that to try and almost disprove the causality that they found rather than, I guess, what you find feel from a lot of them is that people have maybe run lots of things on MR base. This has popped up. They don't really know why it's popped up and written a paper on it. Um, yeah, maybe that's just me being having too much skepticism. I don't know. Um, so, yeah, looking for a healthy skepticism. And of course, I guess a point that completely echoes what Yurene and Margot have been saying, if there's other methods included, in a triangulation design, then for me, those are the papers that I would absolutely yeah, pick out to review out of all of them that I think are going to be the most well conducted. Yeah, possible. Anyone else want to add to? Yeah.
I was just going to agree with you exactly. I, I tend to skim down to the limitations. And if there's not a good amount of limitations, they've not recognized the limit. Like you need to know that they've considered what all the potential limitations could be in there in the research. And if they've not done that, I tend to not believe what <laughs> what they're saying because there are there is no perfect study. And Mendelian randomization is a very useful tool, but it is not it's not necessarily going to give you the right answer if you're not taking all these things into consideration. And yeah, healthy skepticism, absolutely agree, Robin, making sure the question is, it, it makes sense for one, <laughs> and that it, it's being asked in the right way, um, consideration of the fact that a lot of us are using very distal um, exposures that aren't necessarily very linked to genetics. And consideration of that as well is um, something that I look forward to. Shanda, with you too, Reen. Yeah, yeah, I agree with all of those. I think um, sometimes even just the exposure variable might be enough, right? I think that's maybe in Stephen Burgess's paper as well, that for some titles already you might think, okay, if it's only an MR study, this is, might not be as informative. And I guess also... Uh, yeah, so the, the question making sense, but also maybe the expertise being there clearly in the team, right? Because if it's a very specific clinical question or something, and it's just a team where there is no obvious expertise in that, which you can also usually see pretty quickly if you read the introduction or like how the question is posed, that's also uh, um, a, uh, um, a hint, I guess, and all of the other things that Robin mentioned. I would be happy to see your list though, Robin, or your, I guess, so there was the MR conference where we discussed this as well, if we should have as a community, maybe a standard reply, right, to all of these review requests, but I don't think that has happened yet from the MR community. Marco, I don't know if you have any. <laughs> I don't know if I, I agree with everything. I don't know if I can add anything. Um, I think what is quite useful maybe for people who are not so familiar with MR but like to use it is that there is actually quite good uh, papers with sort of quality control guidelines, one by Urine, for instance, um, which can be very useful. Uh, and there's even like reviews comparing all these different quality control methods and stuff. So I think that there is good guidelines, but people just sort of need to find them as well. Yeah, that's something because there's now questions coming up in the chat as well. There are ed many editorials being written, right, about about their deluge of two sample MR. And it's just a question of like, how do you get those under the eyes of the reader? And that's just hard because you, as MR methodologists, you're talking to many different fields. Like there's people doing MR in biochemistry, there's people doing MR in cardiovascular disease, and they're all different audiences. And so it's hard and slow work to get to everyone. But I think it's being done. That's that's good news. Yorin, or sorry, Robin, you had a you're raising your hand. I just want to add to that point because I realised that none of us mentioned that there are like standardised guidelines for doing an MR study, so the MR strobe guidelines. And um, so I guess that's the thing that again you look for when choosing to review a paper, although it's not always ob immediately obvious from what you get see from the um, abstract. But I guess that's another thing that editors should be making sure that um, people mm -hmm. have followed those guidelines. And I also just want to make sure I don't take credit for the list of. Uh, of the things that we look for in the studies, Jazz, Jazz led on that um, excellent list. So yeah, maybe that's something we could share even just like on Twitter or something, Jazz, after. Yeah, and so at least, thing... sorry. No, also in the chat, what's being said broader than the MR community. So I guess indeed, even in the genetics community, which is partly the MR community, but not completely, these are things that are then a bit newer, but we can at least try to make it a bit more broadly known and try to push these things a bit more. Yeah, exactly. Well, that's a good idea. It's good. I think that's a good point to conclude this webinar because we're also at the hour. Uh, thank you for for speaking. I had no plan for ending the webinar, so I'm kind of like running out of words here. But uh, thanks everyone for attending, and um, see you at the next one. <laughs>